Tough a day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this month's GA. Today, Independent Guahan will be covering uh, the topic of our federal territorial relationship. And so we have Dr. Robert Underwood joining us. Our Maggot Talto will be covering our Maggot Talto will be covering uh, Francisco Baza Leon Guerrero. And that will be done with our independent Guahan co-chair, uh, Dr. Michael Lujan Bavacqua. And then we'll be ending with our other co-chair for independent Guahan, Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero, who will cover the Commonwealth of Nations as our model nation. So thank you for joining us tonight and we hope you enjoy the presentation. So with every GA, we like to start off with the NFRSI. So usually we'll have everybody gathered together with us in person, but as you know, with the COVID pandemic, we've been having to do our GAs online. And so I'll just say it so, and you all can follow along on the screen. So NFRSI, Gineni Mastakilo, Gihnaskoku, I Mastakilum, Gikurasonhu, Dani Mastigu, Nani Nasinyahu, who ufres in maizazo, karabai putehi, dan who defendi, i hinengi, i kultura, i linguahi, i airi, i hanum, dan itano tomoro. Ni in shoko liretu geninazus tata, esi who a fitma, i hilu i biblia, dan i banirahu, i banderen guahan. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll be having our GAs like this, at least until we're out of quarantine or until we kind of result back to our new normal, we'll be doing it online. So independent Guahan, I'm, we've been doing quite a few things. We've been transitioning to a lot of our events. And so first off independent Guahan, it's really a community group. And so what we seek to do is empower the Chamorro people to reclaim our sovereignty as a nation inspired by the strength of our ancestors. And with love for future generations, we educate and unify all who call our island home to build a sustainable and prosperous independent future. So in lieu of the July General Assembly, we actually won't be having one because we do have our highly anticipated Nalatla concert. Uh, so this will actually be the fourth year in a row that we'll have the concert, but unfortunately, because gatherings can't be too large, we won't be doing it in person. However, we will be streaming it online um, through Independent Guahan's Facebook pages, and you can also catch it on KUAM. So it will, it will be airing on July 11th from 7 to 10 p.m. And so we have a lineup of artists from here in Guam and also in Hawaii and the States. So we have artists that come from sort of all over. They're all going to talk about how independence has inspired them and also sing songs that focus on independence and how it relates to them as artists. We have a lineup of intergenerational musicians, namely the Trade Winds, who actually is comprised of Patrick Palomo, Carlos Laguatnia, Andrew Gumatalto, and Jonathan Glazer. We also have, as I said earlier, we have a mix of artists from all over. So we have Rose Laguatnia, who's going to be sending a video in, PJ Nicholas, Stacia Guzman, Microchild, Dakota Camacho, Pedro Blas, and Michael Micah Manaitai. And that's just a few of the artists. We do have quite a few more. And then one feature of the Nalatla concert that's actually running around the theme that we want to do for this year is we're going to feature some of our Maggot Talto. So many of you who have tuned into the General Assembly, you know that we always start out with a Maggot Talto or a hero that we look to that has pushed for decolonization and at many times they push for independence. And so we're going to be featuring quotes that they've said throughout their careers and throughout their lives as a way for us to reflect on what those words mean to us today and how that can encourage all of us to push for decolonization. Also, please uh, tune into our Finatu podcast. This is also available whenever you join in on the page and you can watch. We have over 100 episodes and we cover 
a whole bunch of topics. Uh, the Fanatu podcast is also one place where you can see the concert streaming. And so please join us. Uh, Dr. Michael Luhan Bavakwa is the co-chair for the media committee. And so you'll see a lot of, he actually hosts a lot of the episodes. So he has topics from all of, from really all over. He does a lot of teach-ins. And so if you really just want to get kind of decolonization one on one or if you have issues in mind, like you can talk about land or just artistry and different things like that, the Natsu podcast is where you can tune in. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Luhan Bavakwa. He's going to be doing our Maggot Tauto today. And so our Maggot Tauto today is Francisco Baza Leon Guerrero. I'm very happy to be here and happy to talk to be talking about uh, one of the most interesting sort of figures from Guam history in the 20th century. A very fascinating figure where you see his name every once in a while, but, um, but compared to a lot of others, oftentimes he's ignored or not given as much sort of uh, deference or presence. And so, let me share my screen here. Okay. All right. So today we'll be talking about Francisco Basa Leon Guerrero, or as he was known, Kiko Suilo. He was known as the father of the organic act, but towards the end of his life, he really liked to call himself a machete scientist. And so he was um, an incredibly intelligent menhalom natauta. He was very smart, articulate, um, could be very down to earth, jokester in some ways. Um, and what makes him very, very interesting is that if you were to ask older Chamorros, who is, um, who is somebody who was known back in the day for being quote unquote critical? I mean, uh, who was known for speaking out or was known for even, you wouldn't have a lot of protesting then, even though it did exist, but who was known for being a voice against sort of the prevailing times? And Kiko Suilu would often be mentioned as one of those. He was somebody who um, his brother, uh, upon his death, his brother basically said that, um, that you know, if there, was, if, if there was something out of place, something wrong, you know, he felt, he felt like a need to write it. Um, B.J. Berdalio, who he's always connected with because of their uh, trip to Washington, D.C. in 1936, you know, he basically said that um, if he, he didn't like it, when those above took advantage of those below. It incest him and he felt obligated to speak out when he saw those things happen. And so um, we know some of, so my presentation today will come from talking to people that are uh, connected to him. He had no children. Uh, he was never married. Um, he lived for a time with several of his nieces and nephews. And so when I was doing a lot of my oral history research, I got to, I sat down and talked to a lot of his family members to get his sort of life story as best as I could. Because in the 20th century, um, Kiko Suilo is there for a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, important moments. And so, okay, so he is most famous for this quote. The only ism on Guam is Americanism. And by the way, if you are sort of like a PowerPoint uh, fan, then you will recognize this template. This is the organic template. It's called organic. And he's the father of the organic act, which is why I chose it. And so he's very well known for this quote, the only ism on Guam is Americanism. And this can oftentimes lead to a misunderstanding of his position, his life and his growth. Um, in fact, even when I was a graduate student and I was looking at his life and his record, I remember sort of finding this and then thinking that Kiko Suilu must have been like the most patriotic tomorrow ever. He must have been like a diehard, like American fan, because this quote seems to indicate that. And, uh, and in truth, actually, um, Robert Underwood, who will be speaking later, is one of the first people that sort of told me to look a little bit deeper into that and to think a little bit harder about that. Because the more you learned about Kiko Suilu, you, the more you realize that he never probably would have been anything like that, regardless of what, is, what he's quoted as saying. 
And so understanding why he said this is part of his impact and also part of understanding the larger Chamorro story. <clears throat> okay, there we go. So this was a quote that he gave in the 1960s. And I was never a fighter against American government in Guam. I fought against un-American government in Guam. And I always liked this because he acknowledged that he protested, that he would speak out, but he never had hatred against the United States. He believed that the United States could be a good influence and a good force on Guam. He did not like it that America brought its worst to Guam or it did not allow its best in Guam. And so one thing uh, that makes Kiko Srilo interesting is that even as a, young, a younger person prior to World War II, um, he was already known for getting into trouble. He was already known uh, on, for angering different naval governors. And the stories of him angering those governors, uh, some of them are more sort of radical than others. And in fact, when I interviewed uh, uh, his family members, some of them would describe it that he, the trouble he got in with naval governors was just an accident, a misunderstanding. Whereas others would argue that he got into these messes because he wanted to make a statement and he did not want to be treated a certain way and he wanted to stand up for himself. Because, on two different, because the two most famous instances deal with him being thrown in jail at the, on the whim of a naval governor because he had angered a Navy governor. And so for those of you that are unfamiliar with this time, from 1899 to 1941, there was a Navy government on Guam and a naval governor who basically got to decide whatever he wanted in terms of laws. And Chamorro's didn't really know much about these naval governors, but they definitely knew about how these rules and laws would affect their lives and they didn't like it. <clears throat> and so, but you kind of just had to go with the flow whenever they were around, whenever the emissaries of the Navy government was around giving people tickets, you had to follow and you had to sort of just take it. You had to be very quiet and perhaps complain about it later when you were drunk at the Gazera or something like that. And so FBLG was on most likely two occasions because he had angered a naval governor thrown in jail. One of those instances is tied to a Navy governor requiring civilian employees to still salute him when he would enter a room or when he would come in their presence. And so FBLG did not like that. And his family says that it may have been he did it on purpose. Some say that he did it on accident because he didn't see the governor but he, he did not salute the governor on one instance and the governor in his anger and his rage threw him in jail to make a, to make a point. Another instance deals with a horse where, um, where a Navy governor who loved horses was riding in and he saw F.B. Leon Guerrero, who at that time was working as a federal employee on Guam for, for agriculture. So he was not working for the Naval government directly he saw, he saw him and told him to take the horse from him. And FBLG refused to take the horse from him saying, I don't like horses, I'm afraid of horses. And basically just left the Navy governor hanging who in his rage had him thrown in jail to make a point. And so there's many other stories like this. FBLG became sort of one of those interesting figures that people would attach a criticism of the Navy government to uh, because of his willingness at times to sort of speak out <clears throat> now, he eventually became uh, one of the elected leaders, the appointed and then eventually the elected local leaders in, in things such as the Guam Congress. And um, it's here where he, become, he takes his most famous trip with B.J. Berdalio. They're featured in this picture right here. For those of you that are big nerds out there, I like to think of this picture as uh, Gandalf and Bilbo going, or Gandalf and Frodo going into Mordor. Because BJ Berdali is a little bit taller, he's the Gandalf. Uh, BJ, uh, FBLG is a little bit shorter, he's like Frodo. And behind them is the Congress building. You can put the Eye of Mordor on top of that, the Eye of Sauron. And so this was an important shift. Chamorros had been insisting politely and sometimes critically uh, of political rights for decades. By 1901, the first petition went out and more petitions followed, letters followed, 
when representatives of the U.S. government would come to Guam, they would meet with Chamorros who would say that they wanted a, a greater role in governing their island. Sometimes they would ask for U.S. citizenship, feeling that was the best way to get ahead. But ultimately, very little came from these. And so it was decided in 36 to try to send representatives to D.C. Funds were raised and these two went. And um, it was an interesting sort of time. They accomplished, uh, they accomplished some because the Philippines was very on the sort of in the consciousness of DC at that time, because they were talking about, a con there was a Commonwealth bill for the Philippines and eventual independence. So a lot of leaders were more familiar with Guam than normal. They had made connections to, to con Congress people and senators that had visited Guam in the past and they reached out to them, uh, making more inroads. They testified in the US Congress um, now, ultimately, though, and in fact, actually, the quote here is from the Washington Post at that time. Um, they were interviewed in national newspapers, sort of talking about what the people of Guam were feeling. Um, and this one references how uh, one of the Navy governors got really irritated at whistling, at Chamorros and their whistling, and decided to ban, to ban it. And so this trip, however, if you ever look into it, it's very, very fascinating, especially the fact that um, they met with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and F.B. Leon Guerrero, um, who became an attorney by taking classes through the mail, correspondence courses. He took as much education as you could get on Guam formally, and then he continued it by taking classes and learning through the mail and on his own. And so um, when they met with uh, when they met with FDR, it was supposed to be just a very short meeting, of course, because the president is very, very busy. Um, but they were able to meet a lot longer than normal, precisely because FBLG got the president's ear talking about all the great fishing spots in Guam. And so and encouraging FDR to come and visit and that he, he'd show him all the great fishing spots in Guam. Now, nothing came from this trip, though, nothing substantive because at this point, the US Navy was very much against any change in the status of the Chamorro people or in Guam. And so there would be, despite interest amongst the Chamorro people, there would be no change prior to World War II. Now, after World War II, F.B. Leon Guerrero becomes one of the most important voices for the Chamorro people. He travels to Washington, D.C. several times in the late 40s. Um, he works closely with um, allies that are in the federal government and in civil society in the United States who want to see a change in Guam's status. And so, and so um, his voice becomes very dominant. And in fact, um, this, is a, this, this quote right here is from him testifying sort of uh, in 1950 before the U.S. Congress. And what he says and how he frames it becomes the way in which Chamorros up until this day are kind of uh, the, the rhetoric about our relationship to the United States is still sort of trapped in this model. Um, and so he, he went and he appealed to the US Congress, the US federal government on the basis of the suffering Chamorros who have, in, who have unshakable faith in the United States, that the United States will take care of them, that the United States will, will always be there for them. And so what's interesting is that this becomes then the sort of template for how Chamorros relate to the United States. As Robert Underwood writes, this sort of patriotic language, which wasn't something that most Chamorros felt before the war, but it was something that their leaders used with, with great effectiveness after the war, it was like a, a hammer, a political sort of tool that they used to hammer out rights and access to federal programs and benefits that they were certain that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. And so this is where sort of the mythology of FBLG as sort of this um, great diehard patriot begins is with him, with him employing that rhetoric and the, one of the earliest instances you can find of it is when he and five to six others sign on to a letter to Admiral Nimitz uh, just a month after Liberation Day. And it employs the same rhetoric about sort of our unshakable faith in the, hold on a second, let me close WhatsApp. 
Okay. Um, unshakable faith in the United States. But whether he felt it sort of, whether there was sort of this intense patriotism remains another, is, is an entirely sort of different issue and story. But in a way, this is where it begins. Just sort of to, uh, there's a funny sort of Dolores Coogan who sort of wrote the book, We Fought the Navy and Won. She's a big fan of Kiko Sprilo, or as she calls him Frank, Frank Guerrero. And so, um, and she says that his sort of folksiness helped at some point when the issue of civilian government for Guam was kind of dying in the US federal system because the bureaucracy wasn't really pushing it, even though there had been commitments. And then he said um, they were in DC and he saw somebody, you know, there was somebody that he had met a year before when they had visited Guam. And then they, the, his allies were like, you know what, we should get on, we should get an appointment and we should get on the calendar and stuff. And Kiko Suilo was like, oh no, he'll remember me. Let's just go by. And so they went and they visited and they just surprised him. And then uh, this was, he was the secretary of labor at the time. And so, and he, of course he remembered Kiko Suilo. And he was like, oh, Frank, so nice to see you. And they chatted for a while. And because they had this conversation, it got the secretary of labor to commit to pushing something which had just been sitting around for more than a year. Because then he called somebody else, they set up a meeting a few weeks later. And so because he was there and because he kind of pushed it, brought a little bit of Chamorro folksy, folk, folksiness to it, it actually pushed it a lot faster. It might have sort of languished even longer. Now, the question though, with the signing of the Organic Act and um, is that the end of the road in terms of Chamorro's sort of uh, political development. And this is something which, um, this is something which F.B. Leon Guerrero and other leaders at that time had to reckon with, is that their trajectory, their political trajectory had been very focused on finding a place where they would be treated with respect and dignity within the United States. Because there wasn't any sense at that point that they could get something outside of the United States. It was very much focused within the United States. So it takes on the language of civil rights, US citizenship. As the late uh, Carlos Titano, um, Carlos P. Titano, as he says, we cannot ask for anything as long as we are outside of the family. Once we are inside of the family, then we can ask for things basically recognizing that until they're citizens, then the US doesn't owe them anything. But once they're citizens, then they have to be treated better. But what Kiko Suilu and others of his generation realized is that that wasn't really the case. Um, because in the 50s and 60s, there was still the security clearance, which stymied a lot of potential growth and development. There was also other political divisions which separated them, whether Chamorros at the time wanted it or not, from um, others in the Pacific and, uh, and other countries in Asia. <clears throat> and towards the end of his life, when he began to focus more on, so this is from an article about him after his stroke in 1965. And so at that point, Chamorros are, Chamorro leaders are thinking about development. They're thinking about industries. They're thinking about what they can do to, to, to really grow the economy on the island. And in the 60s and 70s, what they find is that federal restrictions and federal influence lead to a lot of those economies never materializing or being shut down. And so it's interesting because he was first and foremost a machete scientist, as he called himself, but he was a farmer. He felt that agriculture was one of the most important things. Um, and, you know, agriculture for sustenance, but agri also agriculture uh, for experimentation, agriculture. As a, as a way of showing pride. Um, he was best known for showing, uh, for growing tobacco towards the end of his life. He had like dozens of different types of tobacco that he introduced to the island. At some point he had grown a tobacco leaf which was gigantic or something. I don't know anything about tobacco leaves, but I read an article that said it was massive. And so, and so this was the thing, it was that for Regardless of the rhetoric that F.B. Leon Guerrero, B.J. Berdalio, and others had used, they were still very much rooted in the island. 
when challenged when challenged by um, the U.S. Congress as to whether Chamorros could take care of themselves economically or in terms of agriculturally, B.J. Berdalio responded that we did it under the Spanish and we can do it again, even if we get our own government. And when asked, how do you know that? He responded, because we have the same soil. Always, and so for F.B. Leon Guerrero as well, there was something to rooting yourself in the soil to root, connecting yourself to the land, and which is why he felt, even towards the end of his life, when sort of American-style politics had come into Guam, and there was a lot of gridlock, and you know, a lot of just uh, apathy, that sort of reconnecting to the land was always an important thing to do. And so, when we, and so towards the very end of his life, he was he was able to testify and speak at the first. Um, Constitutional Convention for Guam. And so, um, and his attitude had very much changed by that point, as had a lot of his contemporaries, where they were seeing other islands around them negotiating with the United States and planning for a very different future in which they might be able to seize their economic potential or develop themselves more. Um, and so that's why it's very, when we think back on somebody such as F.B. Leon Guerrero, who pushed for US citizenship, who pushed for civil rights. We may wanna take the lead uh, or follow the lead of Penny Berdalio Hofschneider when she and, and Anne Hattori later who argue that what they were really seeking was political rights, but that they used the language of the time, which is sort of the very supplic, you know, a very sort of subservient language of appealing to the United States that we're loyal, we would never go against you, you know, but in truth, hoping to find the best way to achieve a better political future for their people. And towards the end of his life, F.B. Leon Guerrero, even at times talked about, even at times him and others spoke quietly about autonomy. Could there be more autonomy for the island? Could that be a way to go? There was scarcely ever discussion of independence, but there was this idea that they could never be who they wanted to be and they could never truly truly be Guam if they were still in this unincorporated territorial position. And so that's one reason why I'm very, um, I'm happy to talk about his legacy because I think he was, a, he was a brilliant guy, a fascinating guy, um, told a lot of jokes, and now he has a middle school named after him. Yeah. And so uh, Sidus Maasi for giving me the chance uh, to talk about his legacy. Sizus Maasi Maget, I think you're totally right. For many of us, we have really no idea about FBLG aside from the middle school. I know for myself growing up in Guam, that was kind of my whole idea of him until we started talking about um, citizenship and his trip with um, Berdalio. And so, you know, based on your presentation, we can see that there was much more complexity around his story, right? He was still pushing a lot of these things even after that whole visit to DC, he was still kind of telling Guam that, hey, we do have other options, we should kind of, and, and he lived that, right? So he was doing it through agriculture, he was doing it through tobacco. And so if anyone has any questions, please uh, post to our Facebook and we'll bring up the questions later on after everyone's gone. And so our next speaker, uh, this is someone who we're very honored to have with us. Many of you know him, Dr. Robert Underwood. Uh, he was in Congress for a decade, and so he knows this subject very intimately. He, he's been, you know, he's been behind a lot of the policies that we have today, a lot of the policies that have propelled Guam's um, territorial relationship forward because it's giving it's given us more visibility on a federal on the federal scope and so today to talk about the federal territorial relationship please welcome dr on dr underwood i dispense a, a dr underwood i think you're on mute okay Oh, there. Can you hear me now? Hungan. Okay, Hungan. All right. <laughs> now, for today, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon and to talk a little bit about federal territorial relations and to uh, make some, um, maybe uh, some analytical uh, differences between 
uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about the ultimate resolution of a relationship with the United States and uh, perhaps what is uh, just trying to ameliorate uh, the situation that we presently find ourselves in. So sometimes federal territorial relations uh, encompasses uh, all of that. You know, when we say federal territorial relations, like what is the federal government going to do with the territory? And uh, then how is it going to govern it in the meantime? And how is that going to um, uh, work itself out? But in reality, if you accept the term federal territorial relations, you've already sort of conceded uh, that the, uh, uh, the you, you, you have, you sort of concede that you have to um, um, uh, uh, be within the framework. And so that's the uh, part of the conversation that, that was there with uh, Carlos uh, Titano and maybe others who felt that uh, what we really needed was to get inside the house so we can decide how we can be uh, better members of the house or how we'll be treated more equitably. And of course, once you accept that sort of cognitively, it means that uh, you have uh, maybe uh, forgiven uh, any possibility of uh, uh, setting up a separate household. So that's always a kind of an issue uh, in federal territorial relations. So the Organic Act and it, you know the historical treatment of the Organic Act and the historical treatment of what uh, Mr. Bordalio did and what um, uh, uh, Kiko Suilo, Tun Kiko Suilo did uh, in the course of his life, both with uh, uh, Tun Bije, uh, uh, Tun Batasan, and uh, Mr. Wampa, uh, is uh, sometimes sort of, uh, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's kind of a founding father of uh, resistance. Now, we don't want to overstate that. We don't want to overstate that uh, because he, he, he did have a kind of a, uh, contrarian streak to him, see? So we sometimes we don't want to overplay the contrarian streak that uh, Tunkiko Suilo had. Of course, I only talked to him a couple of times. I never really had any in-depth interviews with him or anything of that nature. I had more robust conversations with Mr. Wampat and, and with Mr. Bordalio uh, before he passed away. But the question is, now that you acknowledge that you're a territory of the United States, can an agenda of ameliorating your conditions substitute for the issue of uh, ultimate uh, political status change or self-determination? So sometimes if people say, well, if we get uh, something like uh, we didn't get before, let's say we got fully funded for uh, Medicaid payments, does that mean that we ought to just be uh, uh, content with what we have and not question the entire relationship and maybe go to the next issue. Because if we make a laundry list of issues uh, regarding our relationship with the federal government, regarding programmat uh, programs, programmatic improvement, uh, funding, um, little tweaks in how we relate to each other, does that really, uh, 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 does amelioration really resolve the fundamental issue of decolonization? And I would submit that it doesn't, but of course it's always better to have a better life. <laughs> it's always better to uh, get things and it's always better to uh, get new programs. So there's a kind of the incremental approach and then there's the kind of the holistic approach. Now the incremental approach will point to such things as when the Organic Act was passed, there was no elected governorship. Uh, the uh, district courts, had that juris the federal district court had jurisdiction over all felonies and any civil suit over $5,000. Now you can imagine how dispiriting that was for uh, the local courts, which had a very limited function. And of course the legislature was a 21 unit camera and the governor and uh, the governor's assistant called the secretary of Guam were appointed uh, by the, the president of the United States. So when you allow, as the, uh, as the local courts enhance uh, their authority over uh, certain issues and uh, expanded their authority, uh, 
as they introduced uh, the jury system, which was not part of the original Organic Act, as they allowed for elected governorship, as they allowed for the, uh, um, the election of a non-voting delegate to, to the US House of Representatives, do all of those uh, measures um, uh, add up to uh, fundamental change of the federal territorial relationship? And I would submit that they don't. Uh, you know, it's always better to have things uh, improve. It's always better to get more money. It's always get better to get um, uh, involved in programs. But sometimes uh, people kind of misunderstand what is the fundamental purpose of, this, of, un, of the relationship between the United States and Guam as a, as a corporate uh, entity, as a, as a political body. So in the meantime, people are Americans. People feel affinity to the, towards the United States. People feel very loyal. People are happy to participate in these uh, programs. And so these programs have incrementally, you know, like the application of social security, which happened in the early 60s. Now we're trying to figure out how to apply social security supplemental income, uh, which I think uh, was decided in a recent court decision. So uh, locally, whether it in, in the district courts, whether that survives is a, is a whole other issue. But uh, in any event, uh, all of these incremental issues uh, do they add up to fundamental change? So if you're an elected official, of course, if you're the governor or you're the delegate or you're a member of the Guam legislature, you always want to pursue these incremental uh, uh, changes and you always want to uh, improve uh, the lives of, uh, of the people. And so you're always advocating for more participation in programs, more federal funding, more, quote, equitable uh, federal funding. All of those things add up to a kind of a political energy, which is tied to federal territorial relationships, but doesn't fundamentally deal with the fact that Guam is an unincorporated territory, is not technically part of the United States, but is owned by the United States. And so that fundamental uh, issue about uh, the actual uh, relationship between the United States and Guam is, I, I, I would argue that they should call that a United States and Guam issue as opposed to a federal territorial uh, issue. So the federal territorial issues, although it sort of encompasses all that, uh, will deal primarily and, and many people have made uh, incremental progress. So, uh, you know, during my um, uh, term in office in Washington, D.C., uh, we secured the return of uh, federal excess lands. Uh, we uh, added magistrates to the district court by law. Uh, we allowed for the election of the attorney general. Those are all legislative initiatives, which I pursued and was successful at. So when you add up all those, uh, the Foreign Equity Investment Act, um, which made uh, foreign investors start coming to Guam in greater numbers because the, uh, the tax breaks that were given to uh, foreign investors were always fixed at 30%, but now we made them variable depending upon how the U.S. Uh, negotiated the treaty. So all of those things uh, had, uh, had a positive effect on, on, the, on life on Guam, on the economy, on the sense of uh, self-governance, while still the issue of what ultimately Guam should be uh, remain unresolved. So that's the, uh, that's the main uh, uh, nub of the issue. And so you had uh, really people who uh, challenged, had different sort of styles in this issue. And, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Bivakwa was quite accurate in the way he characterized uh, the work of uh, uh, Kiko Suilo and um, Tun Batasat about being farmers and how they saw themselves as uh, kind of representatives of uh, dependent people. We're representatives of a dependent people and you have to treat us so that we can become more independent and so that we can uh, reach our fulfillment. They saw themselves as representatives of a dependent people because uh, their autonomy had been taken away. Um, 
Mr. Wombat and others perhaps felt a little bit differently that we were now part of the American society. And so now that we're part of the American society, how can we ameliorate uh, that relationship? Uh, I don't want to overdraw that. You know, I just don't want to overdraw that because fundamentally all these men did great things for the island, great things for the uh, Chamorro people. They had their political differences. You know, uh, Mr. Leon Guerrero and Mr. Wampat both went to Washington, D.C., but politically they were at loggerheads back here at home. Mr. Wampat was more successful in the legislature, but Mr. Leon Guerrero also had a time as speaker. So, <coughs> excuse me, so that they had that opportunity. So <clears throat> as we go through the process of looking at federal funds and looking at participation in federal programs, expanding that, uh, getting more, uh, is that the substitute for the ultimate relationship between Guam and the United States? I would argue it isn't, but of course it's always better to have uh, the conditions of the island ameliorated through participation in more and more federal programs. Having said that, participation in federal program is still not your right, still not the right of the people of Guam. It is seen as sort of a gift that Congress gives to us. And it is seen as sort of a gift that the American people as a whole gives to us. We'll be good to you, we'll give you this. Uh, will be, it's never framed as a right, you know, because it is pretty obvious that unincorporated territories don't have rights that states have. So by definition, anything that Guam gets is a, uh, is an, in, um, is, in, is sort of looked upon as a gift or uh, as something that, uh, uh, that is granted to you. Uh, without uh, without uh, any thought to whether you should be treated equitably. So some of these are no-brainers, you know. Who doesn't want domestic phone rates? Uh, who wants to have international phone rates, you know? Do you want international phone rates because we're different? You know, so there's some things that are just uh, by definition you say, no, I don't want that. You know, I want domestic phone rates. I want domestic treatment for this. I want domestic treatment for that. And so there's some, all of these elements are, are there and they're sort of confused, but I just wanted to lay that out. Incremental progress is great. And uh, the progress is most often defined in terms of how we participate in more and more federal programs on a state-like level. And all of that is eagerly sought by elected officials. But at the end of the day, that is really not a substitute for fundamental political status change because it is always seen as a gift or as a law or as an allowance made by uh, the U.S. Congress. Of course, I was there and I secured several allowances for that and I'm happy to uh, report on them, but it is, it is a sort of, uh, uh, it, I never saw it as a substitute for the ultimate resolution of the political status of Guam. And even, uh, even if you took advantage of Guam's uh, unique status, as uh, certainly did, you know, one of the, the uh, most uh, uh, laws that a lot of people don't really comprehend is the Guam Land Return Act, not the excess lands return. The Guam Land Return Act uh, allows Guam to be first whenever the federal government releases land. <coughs> Excuse me. That's unprecedented. No state has that. Normally, when the federal government has excess land, they release it to other federal agencies first, then they try to sell it, then they might give it to a state or a local jurisdiction. But under the Guam Land Return Act, because we are sort of different, we were able to argue that Guam should be at the head of the line. I assume that if we became a state, we'd lose that right. <laughs> so not everything is perfect, not everything is perfectly aligned, but we ought to be able to have uh, an understanding about uh, programs, about ch incremental change, and about fundamental change. Uh, a series of incremental changes may not add up to a fundamental change because 
the fundamental issue still has to be resolved at the end of the day. What is Guam going to be as a corporate entity and in unincorporated territory as, uh, you know, uh, as uh, um, uh, Tunkiko Suilo would probably say, is uh, an un-American form of government at the end of the day. It is not based on consent of the government. So I thank you for that, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Zuis Maasi, Dr. Underwood, your whole presentation really did highlight that this relationship that Guam as a territory has with the federal government, it changes all the time. And it's really up to us to keep pushing for this change to happen. And as you said, it's incremental. It's something that happens at a very slow rate because we're a territory. And oftentimes this change happens because it's something that wasn't originally put in our organic act. So it's stuff that should be there and it's stuff that's allotted to the state, but it's just not something that they've thought to, like, they didn't think, hey, Guam's a member of the American family, we own it, so let's give it the same rights. They were like, no, we can kind of just draft it however we want and that's just what will have to happen. Okay. So thank you for that. And anyone who wants to add questions, please do so on our Facebook. And so for our final presenter, uh, Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero, she's a co-chair with me in the Educational Development and Research Committee. So she'll be doing our model nation. She'll be talking about the Commonwealth of Nations, which is a collective that came from some of the British territories. So uh, thank you, Lola, for your presentation. Hey, Fran, Dr. Underwood, and Maget. Um, I'm just going to dive right into it. Uh, one of the things that we do at every General Assembly is we choose sort of a model in the world that we can learn from uh, in terms of the topic we're discussing. And so, um, you know, after all these years of really um, having conversations in our community around independence, one of the most common concerns that people have or statements that they make is, uh, if we become independent, are we going to lose all this federal aid? Uh, there's a lot of fear around that. People feel that the island um, would collapse into uh, certain conditions, right? That's, that's regularly what arises. And so, um, you know, what we, what we like try to encourage people to think about is that becoming independent doesn't mean you're suddenly going to be isolated and cut off. Becoming independent really means that you're going to join a family of nations that work together in the world, right? And so a lot of what being an unincorporated territory has meant for Guam is we've been cut off from the ability to work with our nearest neighbors in the region in terms of in larger bodies that make decisions and share aid. Um, we've been cut off from the United Nations uh, and we really don't engage very much with other U.S. Uh, either territories or former colonies to really look at based on sort of the historical similarities we have and the forced dependencies of colonization. How can we move forward together to all have, um, you know, greater independence. And so we wanted to take a look at the Commonwealth of Nations as an example of something that could be a possibility for Guahan. Um, the Commonwealth of Nations is one of the world's oldest political organizations. Um, it goes back to the British Empire and is essentially a collective of um, nations in the world who were once, once ruled by Britain. And recently they've welcomed in other nations who don't have that shared history with Britain. Um, initially, uh, you know, as the British Empire began to dissolve, um, there were different levels of freedom from Britain. And so initially, in like the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, they had, you know, regular conferences of British colonies, and um, they would meet regularly and try to decide how can we move together to support each other um, as we achieve greater independence. And then it wasn't until sort of after the war, as the world really um, collectively began to decolonize that the Commonwealth really formed. So since 1949, the Commonwealth of Nations, which is simply just known globally as the Commonwealth, um, welcomed countries from Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and the Pacific. Um, today, membership in the Commonwealth is based on free and equal voluntary cooperation between these nations. And as I mentioned, um, the last two countries 
that joined Rwanda and Mozambique actually have no historical ties to the British Empire. So other small nations as they become independent can choose to join a body like the Commonwealth to be able to avail themselves to um, relationship building, but also to aid from places like the Commonwealth. Um, there are 54 independent and equal countries that are part of the Commonwealth. And most of these countries are actually under the age of 30. Um, so they're all still very new independent nations. Um, the Commonwealth is home to 2.4 billion people in the world uh, and includes, you know, the whole span of economic uh, development. So um, 32 members of the Commonwealth are actually very small states. And so the Commonwealth itself sees itself as a body that really collectively works to ensure that small states, small states get equal representation in a global scale. Um, the Commonwealth is, is mostly dedicated to um, shared goals like development, democracy, and peace. Um, and they have a, a Commonwealth Charter, which was only really um, implemented in 2009. So um, it's still fairly new. Uh, the Commonwealth is often described as a family of nations. Um, and at the heart of it, they offer um, support uh, in the, the goals of the Commonwealth. So helping nations who are trying to achieve or greater achieve the goals of the Commonwealth. Um, they also support um, through grant funding, um, projects that deal with democracy and development. And lastly, they have um, a dedication to learning and distance education. So they put funding into supporting their members um, education systems. Um, Every two years, the Commonwealth meets, and when they meet, they make decisions together um, and about how they're going to invest their money. Um, and all members have an equal say in these meetings, just regardless of their size or the wealth of their country. Um, some, some have critiqued the Commonwealth because um, it is still largely guided by Great Britain and the, the principles of democracy and ideas about governance that initiated from their their British rule. However, not all members of the Commonwealth are under British rule. So many of them, as I mentioned earlier, have their own monarchies or have their own uh, independent governments. Um, there are 11 Commonwealth members that are from the Pacific region. So many of our neighbors are part of the Commonwealth. Um, it says uh, all discrete nations except Papua New Guinea, which comprises some 600 islands. So, so all of these islands are individual nations and then Papua New Guinea comprises 600 islands. Australia and New Zealand were founder members of the Commonwealth in 1931 when their independence was recognized. Um, Samoa attained independence from the UK in 1962, joining the Commonwealth in 1970. Nauru became a member uh, after attaining independence in 1968. Tonga in 1970, Papua New Guinea in 1975, Solomon Islands in 1978, Tuvalu in 1978 as well, Kiribati in 1979, and Vanuatu in 1980. Uh, Fiji was a member but is, has been suspended since its coup in 2006. Um, and so that's another thing is that um, the Commonwealth uh, some, some members of the Commonwealth have been suspended if their actions are against sort of the goals of the Commonwealth, but also some members have actually chosen to leave the Commonwealth if they felt that they were imposing too much on their own governance. And so that's an interesting um, ability, I think, in belonging to this body. So um, while it has been critiqued as a neo-colonial entity, um, countries do have the ability to exit if they feel that um, it's imposing too much on their own governance. Um, we really wanted to draw attention to this, particularly because, you know, people say, you know, if the U.S. leaves, will we stop getting aid? And I think this is an example of how former colonies have said we do have an obligation to our former former colonies, especially very small ones who we had forced into dependency to ensure that in our exit, they are not sort of left like like the fear that we hear from our people isolated or without support as they achieve independence. 
Um, and so, you know, we had really wanted to discuss federal territorial relations within this context in light of the COVID pandemic, particularly because there was a lot of criticism around the fact that, you know, people who are wanting decolonization or independence should not cash their stimulus checks, right, or should not go to American universities and accept federal financial aid. And I think what the Commonwealth shows us is that, um, in fact, it is it is not an either or situation, that there is historical um, essentially reparations for having created a dependency that has inhibited economic growth in certain ways and that really both the international community at the United Nations level has affirmed and, and organizations like the Commonwealth continue to affirm that um, administering powers really do have an obligation to be part of the decolonization process um, because it is it is basically their fault that we are in this situation to begin with right and so we have to work together to be able to to um, achieve independence in a way that um, doesn't collapse our small island. Um, and I think the island nations that are part of the Commonwealth are, are nations we can learn from. Um, you know, so what we're seeing right now with COVID is that the Commonwealth of Nations quickly came together to say we had money set aside for climate change and how it's impacting um, particularly the small Pacific Island states that are members of our Commonwealth. And so they um, set aside $33.6 million from that pot of money to respond to the COVID pandemic. Um, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Patricia Scotland, was saying that should the pandemic be prolonged and disasters continue in their huge power um, to affect these Pacific Islands, then we will all be at risk. Right. So she says, we are trying to see how we can better create a resilient system for these Pacific islands. Um, and so she felt that climate change and the pandemic or any health issues are intersecting issues that really continue to affect small island states and that both of them need to be addressed with urgency right now. Um, and so, for example, um, there was recently uh, a, cy a cyclone in the Pacific that had affected the different nations. And so um, she said another $500 million is being set aside to tackle these kinds of climate crises, as well as um, future possible pandemics or the continued impacts of COVID-19. She says the COVID-19 pandemic was clearly evident in the small island states where tourism, one of the biggest economic earners for the Pacific, had been severely hit. Um, she says that you know, people can't sell their fish, they can't run their businesses, and then they get the double whammy of having being dis, you know, having experienced um, uh, things like Cyclone uh, Herald in the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Fiji, and Tonga, um, where, you know, truly these Pacific Island nations had to come together, not just in light of the pandemic, but also to support each other in light of these natural disasters. Um, and so, you know, I think that these nations recognize the value of the ocean and the value of protecting uh, small island states um, and and really kind of work together to give them voice on a global scale. And I'll just kind of wrap up with one more kind of inspiring example. Through the support of the Commonwealth, the Seychelles um, was really able to say so much of our marine resources have been depleted due to development and overconsumption, and that we have to actually dedicate more of our ocean to preserving these areas than other places in the world. Otherwise, we're going to lose it forever. And so with the Commonwealth's support, the island nation recently set aside 30% of its marine territory uh, to be legally protected from activities that damage the marine environment. And the Commonwealth of Nations supported this because they felt that in preserving this, um, this in incredible marine habitat, all of their nations would learn from the knowledge gained in protecting and studying these areas. And so um, they were able to invest funding to support um, this tremendous achievement of the Seychelles. Um, and I just want to give some context, 30% um, setting aside 30% of your EEZ for um, as a marine protected area is far beyond international targets of 10%, right? And so, um, but because of the, the Commonwealth countries supporting this ambitious, 
ambitious 30% target, um, the Seychelles is able to really achieve this and then hopefully become a model for all of us in terms of how can we actually say enough is enough, our marine areas are depleting and if we don't address this, we're gonna lose tremendous resources for the world. Um, and I think that's something we can learn from. Um, I'm just going to kind of wrap up with, um, you know, the Commonwealth is just one example, but also uh, there is another similar Commonwealth for French speaking nations, which include former territories of France or former colonies of France. There's also the Commonwealth of Independent States, which was set up in 1991 by former members of the Soviet Union. And so I think what we're seeing here is that a lot of Guam's concerns about decolonization could really be addressed if we even had imagined a closer relationship with either um, with other US territories um, or former US territories. And if we kind of came together and created our own sense of um, kind of camaraderie moving forward so that we can talk about some of our shared historical dilemmas, some of our the issues that currently impact us because of our shared US colonialism um, and, and really come up with an innovative approach to supporting each other as we achieve greater sovereignty. And so um, I know we have a lot of great questions coming in, but uh, I thank you for tuning in and really giving us a chance to imagine how can we evolve our federal territorial relationship. And as Dr. Underwood said, at the end of the day, um, nothing is worth sacrificing our rights. So how do we, we work together to achieve greater uh, rights for sovereignty for our people? Thank you, Mahasi, Lola, and thank you for giving us an idea of what Guam can look forward to as we move towards political status change. And so one of the first questions um, that any of you may want to address, I know this was something that commonly comes up because of the initial plebiscites that were happening, happening with Guam. And so someone asked, I would be interested in your insight regarding the Chamorro people of Guam's understanding of self-determination and why there is dissonance among the Chamorro people regarding what self-determination is or means. And so they're kind of talking about how, um, remember with the first plebiscite, we had statuses like improved status quo. And so now when we're talking about the plebiscite today, we're talking about the three statuses, so statehood, independence, and free association, and kind of why there's this disagreement over what the options are or what self-determination actually means? Well, I, I think that's a changing dynamic. You know, it, it, would, it would be hard to say that right off the bat that people always had the same sense about what tomorrow self-determination meant or what even self-determination meant. And certainly in the beginning, uh, the, the discussion was about political status change. Then it shifted to self-determination. Then it shifted to decolonization. Um, we don't know what it might shift to internationalization. We don't know how uh, people perceive what their uh, their status is in the in the context of of the world and in the context of the relationship with the United States. That's why I I I, I always endeavor to point out that the fundamental relationship between Guam and the United States is one of uh, owner and territory. You know, I have territory and I'm the owner, and so I have plenary power over it. So that denies a basic uh, core of American democracy, which is representative democracy. We don't have that here. Now, that doesn't mean we live in an awful, terrible situation. We just don't have it. And so that fundamentally has to be resolved. But the understanding of how that has shifted uh, from the 70s to the present is dramatic. It's not confusing, it's dynamic. I mean, I, I always kind of find it interesting why people would, uh, why might label something that's very dynamic as confusing rather than something that's very dynamic as creative. Hey, we don't know. So we're, we're, we're in a sense involved in this process. So, you know, the very first political status election they had in Guam, uh, the winner was status quo with improvements. It was 51%. Now, who would be against that? If, I, if people just put something in front of you and said, yeah, you can have six different things. You know what? 
you can have what you have now only better. <laughs> that was basically what, not really meaning, not really knowing what, what were the improvements. And, but it wasn't a change in the relationship. It wasn't a change in the uh, government to government relationship, the corporate relationship between the United States and Guam. It was just a, almost kind of an idle comment. And so, of course, we want what we have now only better. And, and to this day, it remains a mystery to me uh, how, uh, um, it remains a mystery to me how that even got on there. <laughs> that's, that's the thing because nobody, I mean, there were other things in there like, you know, Commonwealth and free association, which were defined statuses. We sort of had an idea as to what that meant. But the one that won was, um, you know, status quo with improvement, which meant that uh, people were really uh, not really clear that the things weren't defined. So now they're more clearly defined. And so I think the uh, confusion should be interpreted as the opportunity for creativity rather than as, a, as a, you know, perfect clarity on everything. If we were all perfectly clear on everything, we wouldn't have uh, these Zoom meetings. <laughs> That's actually true. I mean, we wouldn't have to keep having this conversation <laughs> decades later where it just kind of changes. Um, again, Vicky, do you guys have anything to add to that? Although I think Dr. Andrew kind of summed that all up. <laughs> Uh, but we can actually um, move on to the next question. So the next one um, clearly talks about the federal territorial re relationship. So somebody asked, has our current congressional delegate brought the issue of self-determination to Congress? Have any of our congresspersons ever brought forth the issue? And what was the US Congress's reaction if it did come up? Uh, well, of course, uh, no, I don't think the current delegate has. Uh, he's uh, sort of shied away from the topic. Uh, that would be the polite way of explaining it because uh, he's more interested in the incremental relationship, which is good. I mean, sometimes people feel that that's their, their, their mission in life. But as far as the fundamental uh, relationship, uh, he's characterized the Organic Act as a, uh, as, a, as a document to look up to rather than as a I don't, I don't look at it as a degrading document. I just look at it as a document from where we start. It's not where we finish. So that's, that's a kind of a different perspective. Of course, the, the, Commonwealth was the, the Commonwealth Draft Act was the major vehicle through which it sort of recognized to moral self-determination and it sort of recognized the concept of mutual consent, which is a, sort of a unique home rule, which is that, you know, in the, the draft act, whatever the Commonwealth Act was, was, that the only way it could be changed in the future would be that both Guam and the United States agreed to it. So that those two issues uh, in the Commonwealth Draft Act were major stumbling blocks uh, to the Congress. And, uh, you know, I say with some pride, but also with uh, some, uh, um, you know, disappointment that I brought it the furthest along. I got the full committee hearing. I had 26 uh, members of the committee appear in that hearing. Normally when you have a congressional hearing on Guam, you know, you get three or four people and they'll call it a, a big, uh, it adds a different sense to just call it a hearing. But actually I had a lot of members there. A lot of members spoke out in favor of it. You know, they gave testimony in favor of it and so on. But I think the chairman, uh, uh, Chairman Don Young at the time was more interested in resolving Puerto Rican political status. And had this act been approved, it would have uh, made it more difficult to move Puerto Rico towards statehood because Puerto Rico would then have another uh, more autonomous option and it would look more like the Guam option. And so that would have impeded some of that. Uh, and so that was uh, basically, I think, the major reason for it. Uh, not going, but then subsequent to that, the uh, the Guam legislature redefined the effort as being not self-determination, uh, but rather decolonization. And so that changed the dynamic. So, you know, it's not like we were sitting around uh, just waiting for someone to uh, uh, keep prodding us. We were prodded, and I think the, the Guam legislature and past legislation, all of which I don't agree with, but nevertheless, this is where we're at. 
I do want to note, uh, Congresswoman Berdalio did introduce the legislation that uh, we that funded the current self determination study the Commission on decolonization is uh, currently undergoing. Um, so while she was in office. Um, they, they she had introduced legislation that authorized DOI to administer $300,000 to uh, the different territories for political status education campaigns. So in our case, we were able to use that to fund a comprehensive self-determination study, which is almost complete uh, and is very exciting and will be released um, to the community in the coming months. Uh, but it also funded an international conference on decolonization here in Guam last September, which brought kind of similar to what I was talking about. It really did bring together um, all of the US territories. We had Virgin Islands. We had representation from Virgin Islands, from FS SM, from Palau, from Puerto Rico, from the CNMI, uh, and it was an and American Samoa, all here in Guam, and, and it was just this in, in Hawaii, and it was an incredible gathering of minds. And so I think that um, we need more of that. We need more from our congressional representative in terms of pushing for the U.S.'s role and in involvement in educational campaigns around decolonization. It's actually part of the U.N. Charter that administering powers are supposed to be involved in uh, supporting and funding educational efforts towards decolonization. And so, as you can imagine, $300,000 is a, a very small budget when you think about uh, the type of large scale educational campaign that still needs to be done for our people to make a responsible choices, a responsible choice between the three status options available to us. And, and uh, I, I would add to that that I, um, I didn't mean to put, uh, uh, certainly didn't mean to put Congresswoman Bordalio out of focus on this issue, that the, uh, the, the internationalization of this issue, again, is another kind of uh, uh, interesting step because people don't really see it as an international issue. But of course, it is an international issue. It has international overtones. And, and it's not like, the United Nations is going to solve our problems. It's still a problem between Guam and the United States, but it has international implications. Lots of people around the world have a similar situation and they're resolving it in many different ways. I would, uh, I've been asked to just tell one story about, uh, uh, you know, at, at, at the end of every uh, administration, and this happened with the uh, the Clinton administration, it happened with the uh, Bush administration, the first Bush, the second Bush, and even with the Obama administration. I don't know what the Trump administration is going to do, but at, at the end of their administration, they always issue a report on why they didn't do for the territories what they wanted to do. <laughs> it's almost like an apology tour. And so, you know, in one of those things, uh, in one of those sessions, the Assistant Secretary of Interior um, was uh, explaining why they were against the Commonwealth. They said, we, we can't, by implication, uh, allow uh, a vote to be determined upon race or ethnicity. I said, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do this, uh, Mr. Secretary. Why don't we uh, say for the sake of argument, why don't we just let uh, everyone vote and then you honor the results of the vote? Will you honor the results of the vote? He says, oh no, we can't do that either. So, so I said, well, if, if you're not gonna honor the results of the vote, why does, what difference does it make to you who votes? And uh, of course, they, they, they couldn't see the, um, the lack of uh, clarity in the philosophical basis for that, which is they were insistent upon putting uh, restrictions on the manner of uh, voting uh, but not extending any other right. And they were willing to put the thing in a straight jacket, but he said, okay, we're gonna be in that straight jacket, but as a result of being in that straight jacket, let us loose, let us decide, let it be a real plebiscite. No, we can't do that because that would really be giving uh, a le level of authority and, and passing it out in a way that had never been done before. And that, that man is now a congressman from Central California. <laughs> I love that story. Uh, just to add very quickly, in terms of the current congressman's approach, most delegates and in fact, most, um, most elected leaders into the federal government, you know, you represent your state, your community, your district, 
And part of it is sort of that the federal government always is taking things from you or oppressing you or mistreating you, more so if you're in the territories. Because for the territories, it's very real. For Guam, at a certain point, you could elect a legislature, not a governor. You had no representation, not even symbolic in the Congress. But then slowly you push and these things are given to you. And so it is about the, the, de the devolution of that power that the territories are always trying to gain as much as they can because they started off with less and the system is designed against them. But what we see from the current congressman is that for whatever purpose, he really seems to be playing the federal side against the local side rather than taking sort of, rather than kind of speaking from the history that we've talked about here today, from the perspective of those that have always wanted more, have the ability to self-govern, to basically have more control over what we, what we want for our island, he is taking the position that because we cannot adult, we cannot take care of ourselves, yeah. that the federal government should have more power than it already does to make sure that we live the way we're supposed to. And that is a very colonial attitude. And so that's one of the unfortunate things about the current congressman's approach is that this is against what almost all the delegates do when they go to DC, is you, you I, never want to take that position. I, and I would add to that, even uh, the representatives from the states will always mm -hmm. argue a state's rights. <laughs> they always argue whenever there's something they want to do and the feds want to step in, they'll always argue state's rights. Uh, very rarely uh, does, a, does a representative or a delegate go to uh, Washington, D.C. and says, we're going to pass laws to uh, control that jurisdiction more. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and, and so the, I always I find that very curious. It's, it's like uh, uh, the one of the things that um, uh, when I when I introduced the bill that allowed us to elect the attorney general that we now have, I said, the main purpose of this is to move the locus of control from Washington to Hagania. My whole purpose is to try to give as much control back to the local government of Guam. Well, they mess up, they mess up, but you know, it's our mess, you know, and it's not up for me by myself to decide uh, that, uh, uh, that we shouldn't do this. Someone was also asking how they wanted a little more clarification on the organic DAG. So they were saying that some people suggest that more push for citizenship and the signing of the organic DAG is an expression of self-determination or an act of decolonization. So is this true? Are we actually exercising self-determination? With the organic DAG as an act of self, I mean, um it would completely redefine what an act of self-determination is if the organic act was included as it, because, um, so for example, people who argue that often say that Chamorros expressed that they wanted an improvement in their status. Um, they point to that there was two, there was two committee hearings and meetings that happened on Guam after World War II in which Chamorros got to express what they wanted. Now, all you have to think is that, um, in 1776, if the British had done that to the founding fathers and then given them whatever, whatever came out from it, would that count as the birth of the United States? If the British just came and listened and then decided what America should get. And so I think that part of the issue for us here is that we shouldn't seek, you know, because we shouldn't think of ourselves as being uniquely different, that we deserve less than what other people get. We shouldn't redefine the term to sort of figure out a way to accept what we have. We should insist on the bare minimum, the bare minimum that communities across the world get in terms of just the ability to govern themselves. And I think that speaks to um, that difference between incremental and fundamental change in that because we keep pushing outside of the organic act, it kind of tells us that the document wasn't really set up for us to be able to be self-governing because we have to keep adding all these additional things onto it. Whereas um, a fundamental change would mean completely changing the status. 
and they need more autonomy that way. So someone was also asking Guam becoming independent. And if Guam becoming independent means that there would be more chances for places like Hawaii to decolonize. And what are our thoughts in including our brothers and sisters of Northern of the Northern Marianas in creating a nation together? Uh, I think I kind of like want to connect it with the last question a little bit. So like in examining self-determination, right, you want to first determine who the self is. And so like, say, for example, a very, a very simple way of sort of asking ourselves whether or not the Organic Act is an act of self-determination is you know, who wrote it and why, right? And in that sense, the self wasn't us. We did not write it. It was not uh, organically created by our community. And there, and by default, that means that it isn't an act of self-determination because we didn't determine what that document would be, um, but we are living with its outcome. I think one of the most empowering, um, you know, parts of the process that I'm most excited about is when we actually do come together and shape what we want our government to look like, right? And, and create a document that comes organically from the people. Now, if we wanted to think about, so Guam achieves independence, how do we work with other islands around us uh, who we have these historical connections to? I think, again, we examine in a respectful way what our role is in that process. So we, we always want to be mindful that Guahan doesn't come in and say, okay, we're independent now, let's reunify, and, and sort of like the whole Mariana centers around Guam's governance, right, or Guam's governance structure, that whatever relationship relationship we foster, whether it be with the CNMI, the FSM, Palau, RMI, Hawaii, however we extend that out, that it's a collective agreement, right? That that maybe there is more, there absolutely is more ability for Guahan to imagine closer relationships with other countries and, and, a, and a form of shared sovereignty or a form of shared decision making uh, in ways that we all agree to, right? So I think that's what I'm always careful about in conversations about Guam self-determination and about our visions for independence, that we don't impose our visions of a better sort of uh, political status upon any other place, right? That it become a conversation that we in Guahan don't speak for the CNMI, don't speak for the sovereignty movement in Hawaii, but that in articulating our desires for sovereignty, um, we need to work in solidarity with others who are also on the same quest and learn from each other and support each other in our efforts. And I think to the issue of, so it, it goes back to what Underwood was mentioning earlier, that so the territories are strung together and, and, in, and Hawaii, is kind of tangentially connected to that because they have certain, there's certain sort of unique, uh, unique issues there as well within sort of the US system. And so what happens to one can affect what can happen to the other because it is sort of, when you're talking about a bureaucracy like the federal government and you're talking about whatever is commonsensical or sort of the prevailing wisdom in a system like the federal government, then something getting through can change what happens sort of for every, everybody else. And so I think that that is one of the reasons why Guam has been stymied in the past is because whenever there's issues which, which Guam, like uh, which we would make sense that Guam or another territory should be exempted from, it's hard to get it because it may not just create a precedent for another territory to get an exemption, but it could eventually lead to states seeking exemptions for those same things. And so I definitely think that, um, you know, whatever happens to Chamorros and whatever happens to Guam can absolutely affect the, the possibilities for uh, Native Hawaiians, for other groups too. So also... It, 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 it's really important to understand that uh, what Guam does is groundbreaking. If, it, if it's able to pursue that, it would be groundbreaking because it would change the nature of uh, uh, federal relationships with other people. So, so now the federal relationships would change, not just with the, the territories, 
but also with uh, indigenous peoples, how tribes are viewed, how all of these things are constantly in flux and constantly in change. And most of the time, uh, Supreme Court decisions are saying, well, those are matters of policy. So if you can imagine that in, 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 the, in the United States today, justice issues have taken uh, center stage. So this is the absolute uh, ultimate opportune time to address justice issues because the justice issues are not all going to be the same. We're not exactly the same as Black Lives Matter, but Black Lives Matter introduces the concept of what are you going to do to resolve justice injustices which have occurred over centuries. And so when you frame it that way, then you start looking around and you say, well, what about other situations? And so is the country at a point now, at a, at a sort of a point of reckoning, a liminal moment where they're looking at these issues and you know, where do we fit into that? And how, how does our leadership articulate a point of view in that, in that liminal moment? That's really critical. Yeah, I also think about how Mililani Trask, when she was here for the decolonization conference, had pointed out that for, for Guahan to make to appeal and make it all the way to the Supreme Court and sort of exhaust all domestic courts and maybe possibly open up the possibility to uh, go to the international community on the issue of who's eligible to vote in a plebiscite, that it would really be something that would, would affect all the remaining non-self-governing territories. And so she really encouraged us to appeal and had said that afterwards an international approach could be that we work together with the 17 as you know all the 17 remaining non-self-governing territories and pose the question to the international community about who is eligible to vote and so that's a, a very a good example of the ways that stuff that things that are impacting us could really open up and impact others. Um, I also noticed some comments I, on after sort of what we were saying in terms of Guam's relationship with the CNMI. Absolutely, we are all Chamorro people and we have the historical ties and cultural ties as one family, as one Mariana's. I think what we're saying is that um, before we kind of embark on um, a collective form of self-determination that we just do it together, that it not be sort of up to us, but that it be something that include all of us together is what I wanted to clarify. So going off of the discussion about how things have been changing a lot. So someone asked um, with both the pandemic and kind of the these more deeper conversation or these deeper conversations that we're having now about systemic racism. Um, are they so they're underscoring kind of this fundamental instability around political paradigms. And so they're asking if something like an indigenous change for cis sustainability rather than for self-determination would um, kind of change the way we envision tomorrow futures. I, I, yeah. I think that's, that's a very interesting point because it's a liminal moment for a lot of things. So, you know, think about it. If we're dealing with systemic racism and then we're dealing with uh, uh, climate change and the, the disaster that awaits us, how do those things get resolved? And so that encourages, I believe, it's like a, it's a, a moment of crisis will create a, a little bit of uncertainty and uh, maybe some chaos, but hopefully it will be a, a done so that will spark creativity and real solutions because that's the only way that you're gonna break that bond, see? So that bond that currently exists says that, uh, Guam can do this, this, and this, and this, but it can't do anything different than the way the relationship is now. So if you wanna argue for climate, uh, to deal with climate change, you have to argue to do so within the federal system. Uh, you can't uh, do so from the international system. You can't do so from the uh, power to control your own resources. You have to do it within the existing system. So these things are gonna have uh, ultimate uh, opportunities, I think, for us to uh, be able to come up with creative solutions. And some of those creative solutions obviously involve federal law. They're not, it's not like, a, it's, it's, it, I, 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 I just hope that, that this message is clear that you can do some of this through federal legislation. Indeed, 
federal legislation, if you can believe it, is going to change things in a very dramatic way because of the pandemic because of an, uh, the, the, the systemic racism, which is now uh, at center stage, and because of uh, climate change, healthcare is gonna change, education is gonna change, how, how we deal with ordinary things, how we deal with resources, all going to change. And so that, that is the moment we find ourselves in, and that's the moment at which uh, we try to figure out how to, to work legislation, I think, uh, on our behalf and in our interest. One of the things um, that really stood out to me when we visited, so whenever we go to the UN Fourth Committee and testify, we schedule visits with ambassadors, particularly from nations that could really form as allies for us. And so when we were meeting with the ambassador from the Marshall Islands, she was sharing with Governor Calvo, who was in the room with us, that it's very important to be sovereign as an island nation so impacted by climate change, because otherwise you get lumped into sort of US, um, all the aid that would go to your island goes to the US first, and it becomes up to the US to disseminate that aid. So in her case, she said at first, um, they're, they're, the RMI was being denied uh, aid for climate change. And they said, oh, because we've already covered you under the United States and uh, the United States. And she had to assert their sovereignty and say, no, we are a sovereign nation and we are so impacted by climate change that we cannot lose the ability to have control over how we get that aid and how we spend that aid. And so sovereignty was essential in being able to meet the challenges that they're faced with and get the appropriate aid. And you look at Guam, um, you know, I agree that, you know, we all need to be collectively working together to address issues of climate change. I think new is issues around sovereignty are going to arise as people are getting pushed out of their homelands because of rising tides. But I also know that if we don't address our issue of lack of sovereignty, lack of voice, lack of ability to represent ourselves and make decisions, we could get left behind and it could be much harder for us to address our own challenges like the Marshall Islands. So that's just a Lesson that I learned from meeting with her and something that we should always remember that at the end of the day, um, without sovereignty, it's difficult for us to join the world stage or even the regional stage in terms of how to address climate change or any of the other issues plaguing our island. So someone was also asking, um, what do we feel are the biggest barriers that stand between us and fundamental status change? And then someone also asked, would you agree that it's difficult to change the relationship with the US until we stop educating our kids with US history and culture? Mm. I would definitely agree that, so we can see the impact of generational change already. Right. And so the previous question is very interesting because the way that my grandparents generation largely saw progress and improvement and what a good life is, was very mixed because on the one hand, they had grown up connected to the land with sort of this sort of strong family network. But at the same time, their perceptions of what was good and important had been very impacted by education and American colonial education system what they saw in the media, what was being promoted around the island. And so we can see that then the, the generations that come after that, you know, there's a strong emphasis on consumerism and consumerism on an American context too, right? That's why, you know, Olive Garden opens up, ooh, everybody line up, get Nana in the car. We gotta go to Olive Garden, you know? And then uh, while, while people in the States are kind of like, yeah, Olive Garden's all right. But here on Guam, that's part of sort of consuming colonial sort of, that's part of consuming your colonial desire is that you buy American things and it makes you feel fulfilled like your late capitalist colonial subject. But what we see now is that there's less enamoration. We're less enchanted by those things. Because like what we see with the rise of Bernie Sanders supporters in the States, we see young people there basically saying, yeah, you know what, America isn't that great the way it is. Because none of the things that my parents' generation were promised, I'm getting. And in Guam, we see a similar thing where there's an openness with the younger generation to thinking about something different. But we have to really reinforce it. We have to give kids, young people the tools 
so that that they can kind of think what is the best way forward should we be an island in which 90% of what we eat is brought in on a ship does that make sense for the previous generation it made sense because that was more important than what we ate here if it came on a ship it was worth more it had a higher status associated with it it was how you became an american but for us now a lot of that has worn off so we're stuck with these questions on is it good for us does it help us does it create an economy that is sustainable does it does it create a bunch of trash around the island does it give us diseases or not and so i think that that's why a lot of it will start with that education what is the framework that we give kids to understand the community around them and the future and very importantly given the moment we're in how do they understand social change and what and how a society improves and gets better and someone also it's it's interesting that that question came up cuz somebody had commented and said that we should consider changing the names of the roads of Hagatnya. They were talking about instead naming them to people who participated in the congressional walkout as a way to kind of highlight heroes or figures in history that pretty much propelled the need for Guam to push outside its territorial status or the need for us to have more rights. And so someone also asked, because um, Maget, you had mentioned FBLG and his vision of agricultural freedom. And so they were asking that, did Governor Berdalio's Green Revolution kind of build upon that? Or is there any sort of connection to the two ideas? And so not, not uh, directly, not directly connected, but, it, but that was, so what FBLG was proposing was one of those things that was lost at that time because he really strongly believed that Chamorro should stay connected to the land. But then um, many of his contemporaries personally enjoyed farming, but did not want their kids to farm. You know, it was part of their identity, but they, their assumptions about if my kid is successful, if they live a good life, it's, it's that they work in an office or they work on Wall Street or something like that. It was not tied to the land. And so the, and the Green Revolution was a moment where Guam could have sort of uh, shifted its perspective a lot because the Green Revolution was just this idea that, you know, we could update farming around the world, incorporate new technologies, and Guam could have gone that route where we could have re-centralized agriculture and food security. But at that time, there was still a lot of emphasis on just whatever's cheap, bring it in. And so we're at another moment now where we can see the possibilities, the, the planting of seeds where we could move towards more sustainability and taking these issues more seriously, but we need to wake up. You know, we need to, and our leaders in particular need to wake up because it's one thing if the people who bring in the stuff on the ships that goes into the stores don't wanna wake up because they have a lot of money invested in it. But those that we elect as leaders it's it's in their it's their responsibility to make sure that we don't have an island in which if a ship if ships didn't come for two weeks we would turn into the walking dead but they're not doing that and so that's why these issues that's why the conversation that independent guahan has are not just about political independence but it's really about these fundamental questions of what kind of community do we, do we want and how can we get there how can we take care of our own yeah, and I feel like, you know, people like F.B. Leon Guerrero or Ricky Berdalio who have that memory of the entire island, everybody sort of having a farm and, and providing food for their family, that people were able to do both, that they, they farmed and they worked if they had to. But, you know, prior to the war, we fed ourselves and the military. During the war, we fed ourselves and the Japanese. After the war, our, our connection to the lands where we farmed and raised animals was severed and so you know you look at early testimonies of the Cong Guam Congress after World War II and you have Guam congressmen saying very clearly you took 
our best farming lands and you've given us these lands we can not use and you're giving us all these new expectations and we just want to be able to feed ourselves again. And so I think that, you know, now you're looking at a generation who did not grow up in that context at all. And so it's it's a new it's a, a relearning of something that has always been natural to us for thousands of years. And I think that that's why it's so important to remember our mega Tao Tao and learn from them and and see how, you know, the way that they live not too long ago is still very possible for us to achieve. And so we're running out of time. So we'll end with this last question. And I think it's a great question to kind of end with. So somebody asked, do we have an organized group of local people that have a focus and repository of information in seeking self-determination? Sure. Um, well, Guam has the Micronesian Area Research Center, which is the largest cultural repository in the region, which does collect and has collected, um, you know, various documents, um, you know, about the, the various different pushes for self-determination in our history, um, you know, the papers of all of our governors. Um, there, there's a lot to go through there. Um, but in terms of something that's easier to access and current, um, the Commission on Decolonization is the government agency tasked with educating the community about decolonization. And as I mentioned earlier, um, is completing a self-determination study, which first examines uh, our governance um, and the degree to which we are governed by the United States and the degree to which uh, we lack self-governance. The second portion of the study takes a look at every aspect of our lives and how each of the three status options um, would be, right? So it looks at education and what would education be like under each status option? Um, what would defense be like? What would the economy be like? Um, all of the things that our community has wanted to know, a team of scholars led by uh, Dr. Kenneth Guffigan Cooper uh, and eco local economist Joe Bradley uh, work together to really answer a lot of these questions uh, under the directive of the commission. And so right now the study is being edited and it's gonna be disseminated. It'll be available through the Commission on Decolonization's website uh, in, in different local uh, libraries uh, and educational spaces, uh, but also, uh, uh, KGTF has, will be making uh, informative documentaries and educational pieces based on the information in the study. So you're going to see in the coming months a very widespread educational campaign with more information than we've really had over the last two decades. Because the last time our government embarked on a study uh, was in 2000, um, which was narrowly focused on uh, the economy. So, um, you know, we at Independent Guahan are also always, um, you know, promoting uh, uh, education around independence and decolonization with our monthly events. Um, and there are two other status uh, task forces, uh, Free Association and Statehood, and they can be contacted through the Commission on Decolonization or visiting their Facebook pages. So, um, you know, I think we're doing better and there's a lot more on the horizon in terms of where to get information. Okay, to all our panelists, thank you all for joining in. Our next General Assembly will actually be in August. We are not having a July one because of the Nalatla concert. So please tune in to the Nalatla Songs of Freedom concert. It will be available on, or it'll be airing on KUAM from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. on July 11th, 2020. And then for those of you who may not be able to access KUAM that way, it'll also be available on our Facebook pages. And so our next GA will be August 27th, and it'll be the same time, 4 p.m. to 5.30. And we envision it's still gonna be online because it'll be uh, a little hard to kind of get everyone together. And so until then, thank you for joining us and we hope to see you guys again. Thank you.